You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. There's a general theme that we see with attackers where they will use things that are big in the news to snare people. We saw it with COVID, we saw it with crypto, and now we're seeing it with ChatGPT. As soon as that happened, the attackers realized, oh, I can exploit this, and I'll send people mail that looks like it's from ChatGPT to harvest their credentials. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. Got some good stories to share this week. And later in the show, my conversation with Dave Baggett. He is CEO and founder at Inky. We're talking about some of the trends that he's tracking in phishing. But first, a word from our sponsor, Know Before. Where would InfoSec professionals be without users making security mistakes? Working less than 60 hours per week, perhaps. Actually having a weekend every so often. We get it. User behavior can be a challenge. But users can also be an InfoSec professional's greatest asset once properly equipped. What do we mean by that? Well, stay with us, and in a few minutes, we'll hear from our sponsors at Know Before on that very question. All right, Joe, we've got some good stories here. Uh, Why don't you kick things off for us? Dave, there's a Russian APT, that's Advanced Persistent Threat. Yes. That uh, Microsoft is calling Midnight Blizzard. (laughs) We need to stop giving these guys cool names. Yeah. Microsoft (laughs) recently revamped their naming uh, framework for these sorts of things. They called it uh, something else like, like, it sounded like an element or something. Well, that was the thing. Microsoft used to name things after elements. That was their standard. Are there more threat groups now than there are elements? I think they're running out of elements, Ah. yes. But also, uh, this framework has some logic behind it where, like, midnight refers to one thing and blizzard refers to the other and... So it's it, not just two random words. Associated. No, no, it's not. There's a method to their madness, but that doesn't make it any less mad. Right. Uh, <laughs> because I'll bet it's I'll bet it's all cool words that when put together sound pretty awesome. I'm just yeah. I hate to complain about something when I don't have a better answer, but uh, I really do wish we had a better system for naming these threat actors because it's all over the map, and the big organizations give them different names, and so. As someone who reports on these things, I end up listing off five different names when referring to something, just so everybody knows what we're talking about. And yeah, there, there was, has to be a better way, Joe. It's just APT29, <laughs> right? They're just yeah. affiliated with APT29, so yeah. just call them that. Yeah. Advanced well, Persistent Threat number 29. Yeah, that's not cool when you're trying to sell someone defenses. Yeah, against, that's right. This kind of stuff, it, maybe so. that's what it is. Maybe it's marketing, you know, for these, uh, all the cyber companies out there. <laughs> yes. You got to be ready for Midnight Blizzard. <gasps> what's Count Midnight Blizzard? That sounds scary. Count on it. Yes, absolutely. All right, so what's but going on? But we have on digressed with, once what's again. What's going? Dave? We didn't even we didn't get two minutes into the show before no. we digress. <laughs> so tell me more about Midnight Blizzard. Joe. So these guys are conducting attacks on Teams users by using compromised Microsoft 365 accounts, hmm. and these compromised accounts are coming mostly from small businesses. Okay. So these guys have gone into small business accounts, compromised the account. They're using that compromised account then to stage attacks on other Teams users. Okay. Uh, They have targeted fewer than 40 organizations, which Hmm. to me speaks of a very manual operation, a deliberate operation. Right. And Microsoft notes that these guys are uh, are very deliberate. They're they're state-sponsored. Yeah. Uh, They're linked with Russia. And they are going after government, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, which are like nonprofits and things like that that advise government bodies and things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, They're going after IT services, technologies, manufacturing, and media. Okay. So this this lines up with an espionage program. Sure. Right? Once they have 
compromise the small business account. Oh, by the way, I want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. This is another reason for small business people to think, well, mostly small business people to think, okay, maybe I am a target for these bad guys. Mm. All too often, one of the things I hear is, nobody cares about me, I have a small business. Right. And I, I frequently tell people, you have a lot of things these guys are interested in, and here is one of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, just your Microsoft 365 account is of value to a nation-state actor. Mm-hmm. So, yes, sometimes you may fall into the sights of a nation-state actor to run a campaign like this. Right. And this is primarily a social engineering attack. They create domain domains rather that look a lot like the Microsoft domain. They're not the Microsoft domain. Mm-hmm. And then they are targeting people that meet one of two criteria. Hmm. Either these are people they already have the username and password for. Okay. Or the person is using passwordless authentication from Microsoft. A couple months ago, maybe a year ago, a couple of years ago, I don't know. I said I was going to passwordless authentication with my Microsoft account. Okay. And it's great. Yeah. But it relies on you having uh, Microsoft Authenticator on your phone. Oh, I true. tried this today, actually. I logged into my Microsoft, my personal Microsoft 365 account, and I hadn't logged in on this computer in a while. And the, the computer said, uh, well, the, the application said, look at your authenticator. I didn't have to enter a password at all. It just told it who I was. And then when my phone said, hey, are you trying to log in? I said, yes. And I was in. Right. And it was great. And yeah. it's pretty secure. But it is subject to a social engineering attack. Mm. So both of these require, both these methods require that a user enter a code from the Microsoft Authenticator app or click on a number. First, the attacker tries to connect with the target on Teams, convincing them that they are from Microsoft support. Uh, So the target gets a message that says, Microsoft Identity Protection wants to chat. So that sounds pretty, uh, pretty scary, I would say, right? So do, help me help me understand here because I I'm, I'm not a Teams user. Does right. does Teams out of the box have like cross organization communication open? So I don't know because I'm not a Teams administrator. Okay, but I've heard that yes, you can you can do that. Okay, uh, and I know that I know that you can do that, but I don't know if it comes out of the box like that. That's right. really the question. I don't know the answer to. Okay. It may come out of the box with that disabled and you have to enable it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, but again, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. But if you accept that message, if the target accepts the message and says, oh, Microsoft Identity, uh, what do you need me to do? They get a message that reads, help us keep your account secure. We detected a recent change applied to your preferred multi-factor authentication methods for your security and to ensure that only you have access to your account. We ask that you verify your identity. Open your Microsoft Authenticator app and enter the number 81. That's the message that gets sent to them. Hmm. Now, what they're doing is logging into the, to the user's account. It's showing them the number that they have to enter. And then they're saying to the user, these are all the bad guys doing this. They're saying to the user, go ahead and open your Authenticator app and enter the number 81 so I can get into your account. But the user doesn't know that. They leave that last part off, right? So I can get into your account. Right. So if the user obliges them and does this stuff, they get access. What they get is an authentication token, uh, and they are in. The bad guys. The bad guys are in. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's it. It's just a social engineering attack using a compromised Teams account. They then change the team's account to impersonate Microsoft tech support or identity protection. Mm -hmm. They send you a message saying that they're from Microsoft identity protection. Enter this code into your authenticator app. You look at your phone, lo and behold, there it is. Right. Right. The prompt to enter a number, you enter the number and you've just let them into your account. And, and they've managed to do an end around on your multi-factor authentication. authentication. Multi-factor authentication. Hmm. So how do you protect yourself from this? Yes. Right? Well, if you're a person, you know, this is just for the individual user out there. (laughs) Say, good luck. Hey, good news, Joe. I am indeed a person. (laughs) Right. As opposed to the rest of the advice, which I'm going to have for organizations. Gotcha. (laughs) (laughs) But if you're an individual user, if you're not logging in, don't enter any codes and don't click on anything. Uh Remember that this multi-factor authentication through the Authenticator app, the Microsoft Authenticator app, is only for when you're logging in. Mm -hmm. Not to verify your identity to some Microsoft uh, user. There are other ways to make that happen. 
But in order for you to log into your account, that's really the only use case for you entering a number or clicking on a number in Microsoft Authenticator. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. The problem with that, Dave, is that that will never scale to an organizational size, right? Mm. Because if you have a 1,000 people and you tell them, don't do this, 10% of them might very well do it. Right. right. They're going to forget. There's always, to there's always Bob in accounting. Right. That's right. It's always Bob in accounting. <laughs> accounting. Right. He clicks everything. <laughs> so Microsoft recommends uh, that you, that you have an organization, that as an organization, you use, quote, phishing resistant authentication methods. Ah. Uh, they also, interestingly enough, they, uh, there's another article that is linked to from this first blog post. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, this all comes from a blog post on Microsoft. I never said that. Oh, okay. Um, but they link to another blog post that says uh, phishing-resistant authentication methods, and they have the continuum there. But up at the top of the most secure ones is the passwordless authentication from Microsoft Authenticator, which I think can still be socially engineered. Maybe I'm wrong. Right. But if 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 all I have to do is click on a button or enter a code, if someone calls into the target and says click on this button and enter the code, they'll do it. So I recommend, don't do that. Just go with like a FIDO2 key. Yeah. Uh, something like a YubiKey or a Google Titan or anything that is FIDO2 compliant. Right. Go with that. Uh, there's other things that are uh, like certificate-based that are, are, are good, but then you have to get into key management. FIDO2 has key management all wrapped up in it. It's very nice. Uh, there's also Squirrel. Uh, we, we get... Uh, angry letters from people that are big fans of squirrel <laughs> that every, uh, every time I talk about this, that okay. that's available. It's, it's open source and ever, and all that stuff. And it uses zero knowledge proofs yeah. to authenticate you, which is good. But I think that the, the FIDO key, the hardware key is, is much easier for, for the average user to understand. Uh, you want to authenticate yourself. You put this thing into your USB port and when you're prompted, you touch it. Right. That's it. Yeah. That's the workflow. They also said, educate your users about social engineering and only allow specifically trusted Microsoft 365 organizations to talk to your people. So this is a, an attack surface reduction technique. If you don't have a business reason to talk to someone on Teams, then no talking to them, period. Yeah. Uh, they should, somebody should have to request access or you, know, they, you have a business relationship with the company XYZ. Company XYZ should request access to be able to send your people messages. And then somebody, sh there should be a process in place that evaluates that. How do we know company XYZ? Yeah. Do they give us money? Do we give them money? Okay, then maybe we should, we should let them talk to our people. But if we don't, no. Yeah, right. So if you get something like this at work, right. well, you actually, should contact you, your IT people, your yep. tech support people, your Ab security people. Absolutely. Uh, if, you, if you limit the number of people, limit the organizations that can send your people messages you may not they may not even see the message right i'm not exactly sure how this works in teams like like i say i'm not a teams administrator yeah but i would i would be shocked if some rando from some organization you don't allow to talk to you could send you a message and you would even see anything right yes i uh, i don't know the answer to that either i'm not a teams user myself uh, but it seems like at the very least, that would be a pretty easy option for a team's administrator to disable. Yes. <laughs> it should probably do so. Yes. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. The difference with the FIDO key is that that has to be applied locally, Correct. right? You're on the machine that's requesting the authorization, and the FIDO key has to plug into that machine. Right. Whereas... The code that comes from the authenticator, there's the opportunity to pass that along verbally Correct. to someone who's in a different location yes. than you. And there is no way to man in the middle the FIDO key. Right. Because the requesting organization, the requesting uh, domain is part of the key generation process. Mm -hmm. So it won't work if there's a man in the middle. The key won't be right or the challenge and response won't be right. 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 Because it will be a different key because it'll evaluate what the uh, requesting URL is. Yeah. I'm surprised something doesn't get in the way. And, and uh, just forgive me, this is probably my own ignorance when it comes to how a lot of this stuff works. And I know you are you have a deeper knowledge than I do when it comes to this stuff. But I'm surprised that the Microsoft authentication app, 
right. the, the app that you're using to authenticate things doesn't have its own under the hood key that was spun up when you initially activated that app on your device. In other words, if someone tries to spin up Microsoft Authenticator on a different device than yours, right, you would end up with a non-matching key and would have to jump through additional hoops. There, that in order may to get be the working. case that that exists. I don't know. Yeah, but if I can just go to the user and say, "Enter this code," right, and yeah, you know, it, it the way it's designed, and it's it's pretty well designed from a usability standpoint. Mm-hmm. I will say that it's it's. It's easy to use, and if if you can use it, if if that's part of your multi-factor regimen, that's fine. Yeah. But the key difference here is that it is two channels of communication. Right. Right? I'm going into the web server asking to authenticate, and I'm getting the authentication channel on a different device, presumably on a completely different, different network. In right. fact, today right. when I did that, that's exactly what it was. Uh, it came over my mobile network as opposed to coming over the Johns Hopkins network. Okay. So the authentication request came through one network while my my agreement to the authentication request came in a different network. Mm-hmm. It has already been established that I am the I- identity. Oh, and I have to use a biometric to um, to uh, authenticate as well. Right. So I have right. to use the, the, the Google phone biometrics to say, yep, that's me. Go ahead and let me in. Yeah, it's it's interesting how the bad guys continue to nip around the edges at, at yeah. this kind of stuff, and and yet um, seems like the the FIDO two devices stand tall. They're, yeah, they're, they're you know, still, it, they're the gold standard. We had that story a couple a couple about maybe about a year ago now, where Google introduced their FIDO solution. They call it Titan. Right. They just gave everybody in Google Titans. Right. And nobody has had their account taken over. Right. Since right. that happened. Right. Like, the success rate was like 100%. Which, I mean, <laughs> if that's yeah. your success rate, I yeah. mean, why why isn't everybody going, I'll take that. Yeah. Give it to me. Yeah. I well, mean, they're 50 bucks a piece. I right. get that. There's your answer. Well, yeah, but still. <laughs> right. I mean, There's your answer. That's... They're 50 bucks a piece and the Authenticator app is free. There's right. your answer. <laughs> you know? So, I, unfortunately, that's the sad reality. Yeah, I would. I would... I think it's I think that's that's not a good business decision. Yeah, I mean because I these things are so effective at stopping account takeover. Yeah. It's just there's going to have to be a ton of security research into well-established cryptographic primitives that we've been using for years to break this methodology, this FIDO2 yeah. system. Yeah. There is no reason to not pay the the $50. It is so good. Mm-hmm. Just do it. Just Buy the ticket. Do what Twitter did. Twitter bought two YubiKeys for every person on the payroll and said, hey, here's a gift for you. Mm-hmm. By the way, you're going to need to use one of these to authenticate from now on. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 part of our onboarding process. Yeah. Everybody gets... You, you know, guys use Google Titans, right? Standard. Uh, I can neither confirm nor deny that. Okay. <laughs> yes, well, I will yes, say... we do. We use I Google use Titans. Yubikey. Yeah. <laughs> That's my device. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. any FIDO2 compliant device will work. I mean, they work great. You yes. Know, and, and look, granted, every now and then with any of these things, you find yourself in a situation where you're pounding your head against the desk because you just want to get into the thing that you need to get into. And whatever your authentication system is, is throwing up roadblocks. Right. And you just need to take a breath and remind yourself it's worth it. Right. <laughs> you know, as frustrating as it is in the moment. Yes. Ultimately, it's worth it. So... All right. Well, we will have a link to that story in the show notes. Uh, Very interesting indeed. Uh, My story uh, comes from our old pal Mallory over Uh, at— Mallory uh, Safaste. Yeah, over at uh, WMAR2. That's the ABC affiliate here in our hometown of Baltimore. Um, And this is a a scam that uh, she covered on uh, their news program there. Uh, This is about someone who— Dodged a Facebook marketplace scam, uh-huh. but found themselves uh, nearly victimized or actually, well, victimized, but all's well that ends well with a, a different uh, scam. I'm okay. getting ahead of myself. So uh, yes, uh, this is a, a gentleman named Jake Larkin who uh, bought a house. And when he settled on the house and went to move into the house, the previous owner had left some furniture in the house. And this, you know... That happens. Yeah, not not a crazy thing that happens. So 
Uh, he didn't need this furniture, so he listed the furniture on Facebook Marketplace. And right away, somebody reached out and said, uh, I'd like to uh, buy that furniture for 100 bucks." He immediately got an email through Zelle, which is one of the online payment companies, or, or let me say purporting to be Zelle, right. saying that in order for him to get the $100, he had to ask the buyer for $200 more and then refund the buyer the $200 back later. Okay, let me let me do the math here. <laughs> so Jake is told the guy's going to have to send you $300 and you're going to have to give him $200 back. That's right. That's right. Okay. So So the guy still has to send a 300 bucks, right? Well, uh, uh wait, I think I know what this is. Yeah. It's it's like a check floating scam. I think you're right. Where they they say we're going to send you 300 bucks and you send us 200 bucks back and mm-hmm. then you keep the 100. Right. That's exactly but what But actually it, what yeah. happens is the $300 payment gets clawed back somehow and Jake is out 200 bucks. Right. Got it. So here's where it gets interesting. So this raises Jake's suspicions. Right. As this it is, should. Yes. This is this Because Zell doesn't odd. work that way. Right. So, uh, so Jake uh, Googles Zell customer service and he calls up uh, Zelle customer service. Uh, and the person on the line uh, says, this is a common problem. It happens all the time um, and gives him instructions for how to resolve it. But it's a lot. And, and uh, Mr. Larkin, who's the victim here, says he, he, he was just confused. So it, no money has changed hands yet. Uh, I, he, the initial hundred dollars may have come in. I, I don't know. Okay. But, um, he gets off the phone with the person claiming to be customer support. R- remember the person he called because he got the customer support phone number from Google. Right. So what that, that's probably another one of those ads. It sounds like. So after he gets off the phone with the, uh, customer service person, the person claiming to be customer service, customer support, uh, he logs into his account and he notices that his bank account is practically empty. His bank account that is linked to Bank of America is practically empty. So he calls Bank of America. Right. Fortunately, the folks at Bank of America were able to make him whole. Okay. There was several thousand dollars that were taken out of his account. Huh. And it, that all happened because the person who he had talked to who was pretending to be customer support, it turns out. Right. Uh, was basically able to sort of weave this spell and fast talk him and confuse him, baffle him to the point where he had access to his Zelle account and was able to drain it. I see. Okay. So, um, fortunately... So it sounds like there's two scams going on here. Well, yes. So, the first scam was the, as you say, the, the variation on the check floating scam. Right. Right. And that is where you post something on Facebook marketplace. Somebody immediately replies and says, good news. I want to buy that. And then they start that process. Okay. Well, Jake was onto that and he wasn't going to fall for that. Right. So he calls what he thinks is Zell customer service and he falls for a second scam. The scam from, as you predict, I, I think we can say with confidence that your prediction is accurate, that it was one of these Google ads right. that are scam ads yeah. where the, the bad guys pay to be the top listing on Google when you search for something like Zell customer service. And let's think about the math here. Suppose I'm a bad guy and I pay a hundred dollars to put that ad in front of somebody. Right. If I can drain whenever their they, bank account. Yeah, whenever they whenever they say Zell customer support, they see my ad. Yeah. As totally the first worth search it. result. Right. Right. Totally worth it. Yeah. So all's well that that ends well here. But um, Dave, I guarantee you it's not a hundred dollars to put that ad in front of somebody. It's no. Probably two or three dollars. You know, I don't I, it could be, but I, I don't know because I, I it's been a long time since I've been in this world or even, you know, played with any of it. And there are some targeted categories that get very expensive very quickly. If you want to be a top result, you can pay a lot. Huh. But I don't know where, where I don't know what that environment is like these days. You may be right, but I think it is more than, 
It's, I think it's more than you would think it would be. Really? I think so. Uh, and I'll, I'll count on our listeners to let us know. I imagine we have folks who function in this world and, and may know exactly how it works. So if you do, let us know, and uh, we'll, we'll do some follow-up about that. In the meantime, so Bank of America makes him whole. Right. right? He, he does get in touch with Bank of America. It's quick enough. They're able to claw it back. So he, he's not out the money, and that's good luck for him. But I would say that's luck. Yeah. Right? Yeah, a lot of times with Zell, the, the, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. So I think because he had the good sense to call Bank of America, first of all, to notice that the money was gone so quickly, and then right. to call Bank of America, that's probably what saved him. Um, and uh, Mallory called the phone number um, that he had called to try to reach Zell customer service. Really? And uh, was immediately directed to someone claiming to be Zell customer service. She disclosed, she disclosed that she's a reporter, and the person immediately hung up hung the up phone. On her. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. You know what Mallory needs to do? <laughs> what? She needs to drive to Virginia. Yeah. Right? Which is just is, is a little bit of a drive because she's out of Baltimore, so she has to go down to Virginia. Okay. Virginia is a one-party consent state. Oh, I see. Right? Okay, right. Maryland, they need both parties to consent. Yeah. So that's why she has to say, I'm a reporter and I'm doing this. But if she goes to Virginia yeah. and makes the phone call from Virginia, she should check with her legal department. But pretty sure that's nice and legal. Right. And she can just talk to the guy and I'm not sure you're Zell customer service. And and record the entire phone call as long as she knows it's being recorded as yeah. acceptable. Yeah. So, um, you know, Mallory did reach out to Zell's uh, customer service, and, and they gave a pretty standard response. You know, we can we monitor things, we we do lots of takedowns, we investigate these things. We're we're doing our best, and and I, you know, I I I believe they are. Um, to me, the party that needs to do a better job with this is Google. Yes. It, yeah. it I, I think it's bonkers and uh, it it's and baffling that Google can't get a handle on this. You know, to, I'd like to have Ben on the phone every every time we record an episode. Yeah, ben Yellen, <laughs> because I'd like to know does do companies like Zelle and Bank of America have standing? Can they call uh, can, or can they file a lawsuit against Google? And say, look, your your practice of selling ads to scammers is costing us money. Right, we're going to sue you for it. Yeah. Because our customers are calling the first thing that comes up that you've engineered to be the thing they click on. Mm -hmm. So you get the money and we're out six grand. Yeah. And I would imagine. That happens a hundred times a day. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask Ben about that. Uh, because I suspect that they that Google is using their Section 230 privilege and claiming to be just a platform. But... They're selling ads. They're making money off yeah, of I don't, these ads. I don't so, think that applies when you're selling ads. Right. I mean, how, how can you not be liable for a fraudulent ad that you've sold and have featured put in front of someone? Google has great lawyers, and I'm sure, you know, there's their reasons. Right. <laughs> but I don't understand them. Yeah, I don't get it either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Google Google doesn't have a, a, a bunch of knucklehead lawyers, right? They, they Like you said, they have great lawyers. Yeah. But so do the banks. Right. I'll let them hash this out. Because people people like Jake here, they're never going to go up against Google's lawyers and win. True. You know, Google, will, first off, they'll just play the long game and wait them out. Yeah. Know? I would also say that perhaps there's a regulatory component here as well. Oh, where... I think there's a big regulatory component. <laughs> so <laughs> There's an opportunity right there. Yeah. Uh, somebody from the, um, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, should be looking at this. I'm sure they are. I yeah. hope they are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is, this is exactly the kind of thing that we can all agree the government needs to protect the people from these, these, these tech companies who just show people ads just because somebody paid them. Right. As you suggest, a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Just, they got to get a handle on this. It, it's clear to me that this is growing and, uh, you know, I believe that the platforms are doing their best to fight it, but they're not succeeding. No. So they got to figure it out. And, and, you know, perhaps the simple answer is until that day comes, turn off the ads. Right. Right. Turn off the targeted ads. Yeah. Turn off these, you know, any, yeah, I don't know. Can't do it at scale, Joe. Can't do it at scale. If you can't do it at scale, what should they not do? They should not do the thing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, that is uh, my story. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. And of course, we would love to hear from you. 
If there's something you'd like us to consider, you can email us. It's hackinghumans at n2k.com. Joe, it's time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from Mauricio, who writes, Hi, Dave and Joe. Not sure if you will be able to listen to this voicemail, which we will be able to play it. (laughs) We are a podcast. We do audio stuff. Uh, I found this scam hilarious about a potential W-2 refund. Uh, Being the son of an accountant, there is no such thing as a W-2 refund. Um, That's (laughs) Those two words don't go together. Okay. Uh, Also, being the father of an accountant, I'm sure my son will be pulling his hair out. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not so sure who would fall for this, but I hope not too many people out there. Here's the thing, though. Yeah. I say W-2. Everybody out there thinks IRS and taxes. Right. And everybody with a job who that's their only source of income, they start thinking about, well, what do I need to file my, my what do I do with my W-2 while I file my taxes? Yeah. Um, you know, maybe 1040 refund would be more effective, uh-huh. but W-2 is the form everybody's more familiar with. Okay. I would say. Yeah. All right, well, here's the voicemail. Hi, this is Ken Davis uh, doing a follow-up uh, regarding your refund. Today is Thursday, the 20th. Uh, could you give us a call at the refund department? Uh, phone number is 855-376-9188. Again, phone number 855-376-9188. Uh, so see here that your business should be entitled to retroactively claim the W-2 employees. Uh, this is uh, the ones on payroll during 2020 and 2021. If you have a few minutes, we'll need to update you with the total refund amount going back to your business, as well. Uh, sorry, as well as the time frame uh, you would be receiving your refund check. So look forward to speaking to you. Bye bye. Good news, Joe. We're going to yeah. be rich. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this company has okay. So now, now it's it's targeted for the company. Yes. So I hadn't heard this before. Now. Yeah. So again, I the companies don't file. W-2s, they send W-2s out to employees. Right. And companies don't get refunds of any taxes that were overpaid. Employees do. <laughs> right. Uh, this doesn't make sense to me at all. Right. Uh, but only because I grew up steeped in this in this culture. You are an accountant sandwich, Joe. You yes, have, I am. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Both above you and below you. Right, with engineer meat. <laughs> all over. Yes, engineer meat in the middle. Mm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that strikes me about this voicemail itself is how um, sort of calm, nonchalant, and matter-of-fact the person on the line is. Did they they pay somebody to do this, or do you think that's artificially generated? I think it's a person. The the fact that they were interrupted, you know, who who knows? They're interrupted by, you know, maybe their kid asking for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or someone else in the call center, uh, which is probably more likely. Um, So... But but I think that's what's interesting about this is how, on the surface, how benign it is, right? Right. Uh, we often hear these things have a sense of urgency. There's no sense of urgency in this person's voice. Right. But there is urgency in that, hey, you know, we got you got money waiting for right. you. They're, so they're not really they're not trying to scare you here. They're trying to appeal to your greed. Exactly. So, uh, exactly. you know, which, which I, when I say greed, I don't mean the pejorative term of greed. Yeah. Uh, greed is a survival mechanism. It's what helps us get to where we are in the world. Right. Uh, but it, it's, it, Hey, there's resources out there that, that in this case I'm entitled to, I should go get them. Right. Um, yeah, this is, this is interesting. I, I part of me wants to get a burner phone and call the number, <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> there you go. But I'm certainly not calling them for my phone number. There, you, That's right. Good, good advice. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Mauricio. We appreciate you sending that in. And again, we would love to hear from you. If you have something you'd like us to consider for our catch of the day, you can email us. It's hackinghumans at n2k.com. We were talking about making users into an asset for security professionals. Simply put, users want to do the right thing. They're often just lacking the knowledge to do so. That's one of the reasons Know Before has released Security Coach, a real-time security coaching tool that takes alerts from your existing security stack and sends immediate coaching to users who've taken risky actions. 
For example, imagine a user has visited a high-risk website or tried to open a document containing malware. Existing security tools will likely block that action, but the user might not understand why. Security Coach analyzes these alerts and provides users with relevant security tips via email or Slack, coaching them on why the action they just took was risky. Help users learn from their mistakes and strengthen your organization's security culture with Security Coach. Learn more about Security Coach at knowbefore.com slash security coach. That's knowbefore.com slash security coach. Joe, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Dave Baggett. He is CEO and founder at Inky. And uh, we're talking about some of the trends that he and his colleagues are tracking when it comes to phishing. Here's my conversation with Dave Baggett. One of the things that we do, I think that may be a little different from, from a lot of the email protection companies, is we really try to study the attacker's tactics and not only understand them, but create countermeasures against them that generalize to new examples. So rather than just identifying some narrow tactic and putting in a fix for that, we try to take a step back and understand, well, what is the general concept behind what they're doing? And can we, can we make a system that will recognize that tactic and, and not just handle that one specific example, but future examples, which we might imagine. So we'll talk about a few of those today. An example is just in general brand impersonation, right? We know that a lot of fishers will impersonate brands like Microsoft and others. And so we've developed techniques to use computer vision to kind of recognize signs of brand like the humans do. And if you think about it, it's kind of amazing, right? You can get a mail you've never seen before. And in one second, your brain will tell you Microsoft or probably one of a thousand brands. Right. So we try to make the software do that. Uh, and generalize to new examples. So we don't just have a big list of Microsoft mails, right? We have code that will, just like a person, look at any new mail and say, ah, looks like it's Microsoft. Well, so what are some of the specific evolutions that you all are tracking here when it comes to the folks sending out these phishing messages? Well, a couple of things we've seen recently. One is, and there's a general theme that we see with attackers where they will use things that are big in the news to snare people. And we saw it with COVID. We saw it with crypto when cryptocurrency was you know, wildly popular. And now we're seeing it with ChatGPT. So I don't know how many users ChatGPT has, but it's some, something north of 100 million. As soon as that happened, the attackers realized, oh, I can exploit this. And I'll send people mail that looks like it's from ChatGPT to harvest their credentials. In other words, get their, get their login information. So that's one we've seen recently. And another one we've seen recently is um, QR codes in emails. So the attacker is kind of hiding their, their bad URLs and content in QR codes. Again, you know, it's, it's a tactic you can look for and understand, but then to try to counter that, you actually need to go and develop models and write code to general, you know, counter it in a general way that will work with new examples, you know, that we may not have seen before. Right. I mean, is it fair to say that, for example, a QR code, I mean, that to what degree is that beyond the average user's ability to unpack and, and kind of reverse engineer? Yeah, well, so this is interesting because if you look at the QR code examples, and we published a few, we published a web on our web a piece about this, and it was picked up by a few of the tech publications. And some of the comments were like, who's dumb enough to click on a QR code in an email? Hmm. But the truth is, these mails were actually very cleverly crafted. So they presented themselves as Microsoft two factor authentication confirmation. So it would say, you know, this is Microsoft, and the attackers realize all they have to do is copy a real Microsoft mail, just copy the HTML and CSS, and it looks perfect, and they would stick their own QR code in. And so the victim thinks, oh, I'm supposed to do this on my phone to confirm something with Microsoft. It looks 
totally plausible. And of course, the human has no idea what the QR code says, right? It's right. a QR code. Right. So it's totally opaque to them and it looks like any other QR code. So how are they supposed to know this is going to take them to some nasty credential harvesting site? Yeah, it's a great point. And I, I guess it's the, the two sides of the coin of the, the convenience of something like a QR code, but uh, that convenience can also be a shortcut for the bad actors. Absolutely. And again, they know everybody trusts Microsoft, right? They know everyone knows the brand. They know people are now comfortable with QR codes. That was another consequence, I guess, of the pandemic where your restaurants, you are always using QR codes and so everyone knows what they are. Mm. And, and what's even more problematic with these mails is when you click that QR code, it takes you to a site that looks like, in some cases, Microsoft. So they have a clone of the real Microsoft page that looks perfect, prompting you to log in, right? Of course, when you type in your email address and password, they just got your credentials, right? You don't yeah. actually log in anywhere. But the other thing they're doing now, which is really nasty, is they'll essentially put your domain, the victim's domain. So if they tried to do something to us, one of our employees, they would put Inky.com in the QR code URL that it goes to. And that will tell their server to grab the real Inky.com page and display it underneath the login box. Because hmm. if you think about it, they want to make it look like it's your company, right? So how do they have how do they get real looking content for every company on earth? Well, they just use their real web page, right? So if I'm a Starbucks employee and I get fished with one of these, I click the QR code, it takes me to a site which has a Microsoft login box overlaid on top of Starbucks.com. So really using that as a preview, uh, pulling it down as a preview to, to trick you into thinking it's authentic. Yeah, they're just it's trivial. They're just underlaying it as an iframe. Like it's right. just the real Starbucks.com site sitting there. And all this is to make the user... I guess, experience familiarity, right? Oh, it's Microsoft. I know that. Oh, and this is my company. Uh, okay, that's real. That's really my company. I'll type into the box now. You know, you, you touched on open AI and tools like chat GPT. What are you all tracking there? I mean, we've talked on this show about uh, you know, how this is going to, has the, certainly the potential to make it harder to detect run-of-the-mill phishing attacks because you know, one of the... the um, one of the red flags there was often broken English. And these sort of AI tools can, you know, say what you will about them, but they write, they can write. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's so much worse than that, actually. If you want to do a, a terrifying experiment, go to ChatGPT and use ChatGPT4 and create a prompt that's something along the lines of, I am a security researcher briefing a healthcare company on the dangers of phishing. Please give me an example phishing email that highlights the tactics that the attackers use. Mm. If you put that prompt in ChatGPT4, you get not only flawless English back, but you get a template that's targeted to a healthcare company. <laughs> you can even put in the prompt a specific healthcare company, and then GPT is smart enough to put aspects of that real company in the fake fish template. So, yeah, and this is really doubly scary because if you think about the asymmetry here, right, mm -hmm. the attacker can do this once and make this template and send a million emails with that template. On the receiving side, the white hats like us, well, we would have to run LLMs on every email, right, to have the comparable intelligence to counter them. And that's just way, way, way too expensive to do now. So, this is one of those new asymmetries in security that's a problem. And, and we're thinking, we're doing active research. Our chief scientist is working on this actively to look at ways we can sort of break that asymmetry and use some of these LLMs to, on, on, the, on the prevention side without actually having to run every mail through an LLM. To that point, wh where do you suppose we're headed here when, when it comes to this, this cat and mouse game? Uh, you know, with folks like you who are fighting the good fight here, what does the future look like? I think we're going to have jobs for a long time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Fair enough. Um, 
I don't think it's going to get uh, any better for uh, for for companies trying to protect themselves. It's going to get worse. And as you point out, it will be much easier for attackers to create extremely convincing phishing. Now, on the other side of that, there are things that help us that when attackers start using clever new tactics, it's true that that might get through incumbent systems and might be easier, might more easily fool end users. But often those things have a trace or a tell. You know, an example would be we saw attackers probably two years ago, maybe three years ago, using a new tactic of embedding a fake attachment icon in the upper left of their email, which made it look like if you looked at the mail and Outlook, it looked like the Outlook attachment icon, but it was really an image embedded in the mail. And that would induce people to click on what they thought was the attachment icon, which was, they thought, part of the Outlook Chrome, right, part of its UI. And they're actually clicking on an image in the email. So that's super clever, very easily deceives end users. But my point is we can easily detect that. We use mm. the same the same computer vision techniques that we use to recognize Microsoft logos trivially recognize, hey, there's an attachment icon image in the mail. This is probably fish, right? So for a lot of these techniques that they're using, they're clever, but also make it very obvious that they're fishy to us once we can develop a model to recognize the use of that tactic. I'm curious for, for your insights. You know, I think like a lot of folks out there, you know, one of my... Uh, responsibilities in life is help, trying to help protect my parents from these sorts of things. And, you know, my father in particular, he's, he is elderly. He, he finds these things challenging. Um, and the reality is, you know, that's only going in one direction, right? He's, he's not going to be getting any better at this. You know, I don't have a corporate IT department to help protect him with his Gmail or his, you know, Microsoft office mail or whatever, do you have any advice, any words of wisdom for those of us who are out there, you know, trying to look out for our families? I do. Yeah. I mean, and one of our frustrations is we the, just given the way the big mail providers work, we can't inject ourselves into the consumer mail flow like we can the corporate mail flow. Mm. So if you have an Office 365 account or you have a Google Workspace account for your company, you can add Inky, right? You can, we can insert ourselves in the, in the mail flow there and, and scan all the mail. We can't do that with gmail.com or office.com or outlook.com. So we can't even offer something like if we wanted to offer a free protect consumers that your, your grandfather could use, there's no way for us to deploy that. We just, hmm. just it's not possible. So that's frustrating. Yeah. But the, the advice that I give is, Basically, for someone like that, and it's good advice for everyone, just don't click on links and mails ever. So, for example, if he gets a mail that appears to be from United Airlines, he shouldn't click anything in that mail. He should just type united.com into his browser. In mm -hmm. other words, just go outside of email, go straight to the site, and then you know because you're going to get a, a TLS session with a legitimate website, it's really United, United Airlines, right? And so rather than rely on the links in the mail that appear to be from a brand, recognize, well, anybody could make any mail look like any brand, just the way mail works. Mm -hmm. Go directly to the source. And similarly, if someone asks you to do something in email, confirm it in some sort of outside channel, Teams or Slack or call them you know, have a second kind of communication channel to verify the identity. Because the m number one thing that's bad about email is it's very easy to spoof both people and brands. It's just a legacy of the way mail works. Joe, what do you think? You didn't talk for a long time about this, but I wanted to touch on this. Yeah. Uh, brand recognition is a huge psychological component in marketing. Right. And Dave notes that we recognize brands in less than a second. Yes. Which is amazing to me. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about the Pepsi logo, they used to put the word Pepsi in the old logo. 
Now it's kind of off to the side. Mm-hmm. But if you just see that circle, the one that kind of looks like a little bird now, right, with the the blue and the red and the white, yeah, you still think Pepsi, right? Really quickly, and companies have paid a lot of money so that we can be programmed deep down to make that association with the with the picture, the company in the picture or the product in the picture, mm-hmm. and. What's happening here is that bad guys are exploiting that. They've, they, they're taking advantage of the fact that the companies have already dumped tons of money into the brand recognition mm. so that when we see something, we, we don't even think about it. Right. Right? We just go, oh, this is whoever, Microsoft uh, or you know, maybe McAfee or whatever, whoever they're impersonating, the brand recognition helps. Mm-hmm. And they're just exploiting something that we already have inside of us. Yeah. I like what he says about trying to understand the tactics and then generalizing the tactic in software such that the general case can be handled by the software. Mm. That Mm. is a pretty big problem. uh, But from what Dave is saying, Inky, that's one of the things they're working on or one of the things they try to do. Yeah. Uh, But bad guys, number one, will go whatever is in the news and the examples he talks about, we've talked about here, uh, COVID, Mm. crypto, Chat GPT, right? You know, we've we've had story after story about uh, on on this show. We, like you said, every uh, every podcast became an AI podcast when Chat GPT <laughs> came out. That's right. <laughs> but then we started talking about uh, the account takeovers, yeah, that were happening. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we've also talked numerous times about QR codes yep. and how we've gotten comfortable with them. Right. I'm still the the dork that pulls out the phone and goes, "Hold on, let me check the veracity <laughs> of this QR code before we go looking at it." Right. Um, and everybody's like, Joe, I just want to order my chicken nuggets. Right. Exactly. <laughs> well, just tell you, if you chicken nuggets, they have chicken nuggets. Just right. tell the waitress you want your, your chicken nuggets right. and you'll get them. Right. <sighs> there was a, a great story. So we went to, uh, went to this restaurant and I said, uh, I was looking at the Reuben and I said, ah, the Reuben's kind of same sandwich everywhere I go. Is this fried chicken tenderloins? That's how they described it on the menu. I'll mm-hmm. try that. The woman goes, you want any dipping sauce? I'm like, no, just. And as the waitress walks away, my kids go, you just ordered chicken tenders. And I was like, what? No. <laughs> That's not what I wanted. It's not what's described in the menu. Uh-huh. Fried chicken tenderloin sounds like, ooh, Gordon Ramsay's back there cooking yeah. me up something. Right. No, it's not just, it, it was just chicken tenders out of a box. Deconstructed. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so disappointing. Uh, how were they? <laughs> like every chicken tender, they were they were fine. Okay, they were right. Man, you know, it's why right. kids get them everywhere they go because yeah. they're always the same. Yeah, right? I did. I did wish that I had ordered some dipping sauce. <laughs> okay, back to our story. Back to our story. <laughs> With these attacks, you can't do them one by one. You have to generalize them up to the big, the big picture. Mm-hmm. That's what you have to do because. You think about these guys out there, they can send hundreds of spam emails or, or phishing emails a minute and sure. you got to fight them all. You can't, you have to, your software has to be able to generate your product, your security product has to be able to generalize them and your people have to be able to recognize when they're being targeted by a phishing campaign or a spear phishing campaign. Right. They can impersonate an email just by copying it. We've seen this a hundred times. In catches of the day with with McAfee, uh, particularly with the McAfee products, they can impersonate a website by just copying it. Or as Dave talks about here, this is a great idea. I don't know why this never occurred to me as a bad guy thing to do Mm. uh, in my adversarial thinking. Just put the actual website underneath of what they're looking at in an iframe, and then put make sure that your uh, that your box, your 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 login box looks like the actual Microsoft login page mm-hmm. or, you know, the little, uh, the, the, you know, the, the Microsoft 365 login prompt because, you know, Dave, when I log in through my Hopkins stuff, we use Office 360 or Microsoft 365. It kind of looks like the background. It, it can, that's exactly what it looks like. Right. So this is a very effective technique. Even though you're not looking at the, the right page, it'll look for all the world that you are looking at the right page because the right page is included in the what you see. Right. You can prevent having to update it. As a bad guy, this is a great idea. <laughs> um, 
I don't know what their what uh, what website hosts can do to stop that from happening. I don't know if there's anything they can do. Yeah, uh, it's just something you got to be aware of. It's interesting that there are tells in these things, uh, mm-hmm. and the one tell that that Dave was talking about was the uh, the image that looks like the attachment uh, image, right? Mm-hmm. So if you can you can have visual uh, you know machine vision on that and say, hey, that's just a, a PNG that looks like it's supposed to be an attachment. That's spam. Right. right. Or that's a phishing attack. That's great. Companies like uh, Inky can use those kind of things. So there are tells that it, that it can be used. All these things have uh, fraudulent pieces that should stick out like sore thumbs, but don't. To the, to the user, they're very subtle, but I think to uh, machines, they should be able to be recognized. Yeah. All right. Well, our thanks to Dave Baggett from Inky for joining us. We do appreciate him taking the time for us. We want to thank all of you for listening. And of course, we want to thank our sponsors at Know Before. They are experts in helping users do the right thing through new school security awareness training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. Our thanks to the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. The show is edited by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening.